Hello class, this is Dr. Palmer here and we're going to be looking at the new face of state and local government. And in this chapter we're discussing sub-national government with an eye towards two important characteristics, revitalization and diversity. Since the early 1960s, the states have become revitalized in their institutions, their personnel, and their role in the federal system. With the weight of the philosophical argument about where pol public policy making power should lie, in the federal system, swinging strongly towards the states for the past 30 years, the federal government has provided the states and localities with increasing control over policy making. State constitutions typically include provisions for separation of powers, legislative powers, executive powers, judicial powers, local uh, governments, taxation and finance, and a bill of rights. States tend to have constitutions that are considerably longer than the U.S. Constitution. Most are burdened with details that attempt to spell out governmental authority and, li and limit governmental power. Most states avoid the politically difficult process of writing a new constitution. Instead, most have adopted their governing documents by adding periodic amendments through a two-step process of proposal and ratification. Most top-level state policymakers are elected to office, and recently greater attention has been given to state election by voters. Most gubernatorial elections are held in non-presidential election years, and have become similar to presidential elections with their reliance on the mass media and money, and being candidate-based rather than party-based. State legislatures were malapportioned for much of the 20th century, giving greater representation to rural areas than their population warranted. Following a succession of U.S. Supreme Court decisions in the mid-1960s, such as Baker v. Carr in 1962 and Reynolds v. Sims in 1964, state legislative districts were, were redrawn to adhere to the principle of one person, one vote. The results included an increase in urban state represent representatives and senators, the election of a larger number of Republicans in the South, and in large states such as New York and California. The legislatures are now younger, better educated, and more racially and ethnically diverse. Legislative elections in the 1990s were less dependent on candidate personality and the mass media than are gubernatorial races, though they are becoming more like congressional races. State legislatures are more closely divided today than in previous decades and about half of the states have divided legislatures. Divided government exists when a single party does not control both chambers of the state legislature and the governor's office. After the 2008-2009 elections, 23 states had divided government, approximately the same level as had been seen in the mid-1980s. Since 1990, 21 states have adopted term limits for state legislators, most exclusively through direct democracy mechanisms. Elected state officials have become increasingly div diverse with respect to race and gender. Governors and the Executive Branch Like the President, governors are expected to wear many hats in their jobs. A governor directs a complex state government and the programs it administers. Governors initiate much of the legislation that state legislators will adopt. They help manage conflict and they must work with a number of other elected executive officers to produce public policies. Recent governors have often had previous experience as a statewide elected official or have held a federal elective position. Various state level reforms have enhanced the, the formal powers of some governors, with governors in seven states being ranked as very strong. 18 governors ranked as strong, 10 ranked as moderate, and governors in 15 being ranked as weak. Two of a governor's most important formal powers for controlling state governments are the veto and the executive budget. Governors in 42 states have a line item veto that permits them to veto or amend portions of a budget bill or legislative language. Governors also enhance their influence with more personal powers. In sharp contrast to the political hacks who commonly serve as governors early in this century, the modern governor is likely to be bright, experienced, and capable of managing the diverse problems of a state. 
So many independent executives, commissioners, and boards work within state governments that many politicians and scholars have called for major state government reorganization to allow governors more control and to generally increase efficiency. Such reorganization seldom results in cost savings and efficiency benefits often promised by its proponents. In 43 states, voters elect a lieutenant governor who has few formal duties beyond presiding over the state senate and being in succession path for governor. Other important state officials include the attorney general, treasurer, secretary of state, and auditor. State legislatures are far more active, informed, representative, and democratic today than they were 40 years ago. Like Congress, state legislatures are responsible for a myriad of tasks as public representatives, making laws, appropriating money, overseeing the executive branch, approving the governor's appointments, and serving constituents. State legislatures also perform duties assigned to them by the U.S. Constitution, such as ratifying proposed amendments to the Constitution and redrawing congressional districts following each census and reapportionment. Three types of legislative professionalism reforms have been passed over the past three decades. Increasing the strength of legislative sessions, increasing legislators' salaries, and increasing the professional staff available to legislators. Not all agree that these are positive changes. We may now be seeing the beginning of a deprofessionalizing trend in some states as some harken back to the Jeffersonian ideal of the citizen legislature. Term limit laws are the most obvious manifestation of this, but recent laws in California limiting legislative staffing and in Colorado limiting the powers of the legislative leadership may also signal that the legislative professionalism movement is cyclical. State court systems. Most judicial business in the United States occurs in the state court systems. State courts have 100 times the number of trials and hear five times more appeals than federal courts. States have generally organized their courts into a three-tier system of trial courts, intermediate courts of appeal and a court of last resort, similar to the model of the organization of the federal courts. Trial courts are organized on a local basis. A single judge presides over each case and citizens are called upon to serve as jurors and members of grand jury panels. It is at the trial court level that the facts of the case are considered, along with due process guarantees required for the accused under the U.S. Constitution. Appeals may be made to an intermediate court of appeals in 38 states. In other states, appeals go directly to the court of last resort. Appeal courts are organized on a regional basis in which judges work together in panels of three or more. Juries are not used in appellate courts. Instead, judges read briefs and hear arguments prepared by lawyers that address legal issues such as whether the law was appropriately applied at the trial court level and whether due process of law was followed. All states have a court of last resort, usually called a Supreme Court, that is the final appellate level in a state. The court of last resort hears both civil and criminal cases on appeal, except in Oklahoma and Texas, which have two top courts, one for civil appeals and one for criminal appeals. Supreme Court decisions are significant policy actions. These courts are often called upon to practice judicial review of actions of the state legislature and the executive branch, to interpret laws and the state constitution, and to make judicial policy. Popular elections are used to choose judges and justices for a limited term of office in some states, such as Texas. Some states still use partisan ballots for judicial elections, but many have begun to choose judges on nonpartisan ballots. In Texas, we use partisan ballots. The most recent wave of judicial selection reforms in 16 states was the adoption of a hybrid system of app appointment and election known as the Merit Plan. Direct democracy. Constitutional initiative, legislative initiative, referendum, and recall are all tools of direct democracy introduced during the progressive era. Some observers feel that these two tools often lead to poorly crafted initiatives and that they provide another avenue of political influence for better financed, more privileged interest groups. Local governments. The intergovernmental relationship between states and their inferior local governments is important to understand to understanding government 
as is the relationship between the national government and the states. It is not, however, nearly as ambiguous a relationship as that between the national and state governments. The basic relationship is that the local governments are totally subservient to the state government. According to Dillon's rule, local governments have only those powers that are explicitly given them by the states. Many cities have managed to get state legislatures to grant them a, de a degree of autonomy in their local charter. Some states allow cities to write their own charters and change them without permission. This is called home rule. There are 89,476 governments in the United States. Many Americans believe that public policy is best produced by governments that are closest to the people. Every U.S. citizen lives within the jurisdiction of a national government, a state government, and perhaps 10 to 20 local governments. However, the vast number of government is as much a burden as a boon to, dem to democracy. Most city and school district governments are located in a county called a parish in Louisiana and a borough in Alaska. And also county government is the administrative arm of state government in a local area. County governments keep records of birth, death, marriage, establish a system of justice and law enforcement, maintain roads and bridges, collect taxes, conduct voter registration and elections, and provide for public welfare and education. County governments usually consist of an elected county commissioner that makes policy and a collection of row officers, such as sheriff, prosecutor, county clerk, and assessor, who run county services. Some urban counties now elect a county executive or appoint a county administrator. Township governments are found in 20 states. Most have limited powers to assist with services in rural areas, but some function much like city governments. Townships can provide for public highways and local law enforcement, keep records of vital statistics and tax collections, and administer elections. Municipalities or city governments must provide most basic local programs and services, such as police and fire protection, street maintenance, solid waste collection, water and sewer works, park and recreation services, and public planning. Many local communities in the United States were originally operated under the town meeting form of direct democracy, where all voting adults in a community gathered once a year to make public policy. Since cities became too large for the town meeting style of governance, three modern forms of municipal government have been used. Mayor city government, with weak and strong variations, city manager government, and commission government. Most city council members and mayors are elected on a nonpartisan ballot Traditionally, city council members represented a district or ward of the city, a practice that permitted the ward-based machine bosses to control elections. Reformers advocated at-large city elections, with all members of the city council chosen by voters across the city. An unintended consequence of at-large representation is that minority group members have had difficulty gaining election to the city council. School districts are responsible for delivering education programs in 13,051 areas of the country. Most school systems are run as independent local governments. In an independent school district, local voters within a geographically defined area are responsible for their own public education system. Within the guidelines of state policy and the parameters of state funding, locally elected school boards and appointed administrators deliver education services. One of the hottest debates in school policy today concerns how to pay for and guarantee equity in public education. The United States also has 37,381 independent limited purpose governmental units other than school districts known as special districts. This classification includes a wide variety of local districts for parks, natural resources, fire protection and libraries, as well as public authorities and boards and governmental corporations that can be found in every state. Special districts represent the fastest growing form of local democracy during the past two decades and often result from the need of local governments to coordinate in a policy area. Each governing body in a fragmented metro metropolis tends to look at problems from its own narrow, partial perspective. As a result, local bodies fail to coordinate with one another and plan effectively for the region's future needs. This fragmented nature of local government leads to racial and class inequalities. 
With a few notable exceptions, prospects for increased cooperation among local governments remains dim. In many areas of the country, a Council of Governors, or governments, frequently referred to as COG, exists within officials wherein officials from various localities meet to discuss mutual problems and plan joint cooperative action. Council of Governments COGs, are often formally very weak, underfunded, poorly staffed, and lacking in any real legislative or taxing power. State and Local Finance Policy The finances of state and local governments are a confusing array of responsibilities, revenues, and budgets. This situation is primarily due to different ways in which states and their local governments have allocated the functional responsibilities among local governments. State government revenues are derived from a variety of sources. States receive the largest share of revenue, 49.1% from taxes, primarily sales taxes, income taxes, and motor vehicle and fuel taxes. The second largest source of state revenue is aid from the federal government, almost 23.6% followed by revenue from state insurance programs, approximately 20.7%. Smaller revenue sources include charges for services, state-operated liquor stores, utilities, payments from local governments, and a number of uh, miscellaneous sources. Nearly 50% of state money goes to operating state programs, construct state buildings, and provide direct assistance to individuals. Approximately 28% is allocated from aid to local governments. Local governments al al allocated the bulk of their money to education, about 38%, followed by health and social services, about 11%, and public safety, about 10%. Understanding state and local governments. States have been willing to decentralize their governing arrangements to permit the creation of grassroots oriented local governments to address citizens' policy demands. The very existence of so many governments to handle so many different and needed services speaks to the health of democracy. Yet state and local politics are not perfectly democratic. There is poor coverage in the media, there are low levels of citizen participation, business interests have substantial leverage in state and city affairs, and term limits can also have undemocratic uh, aspects. Growth in state and local government employment has exceeded that of the federal government for most of this century. Most of the growth has been associated with heightened demands for state and local residents for more governmental programs. Many state and local governments have tried to reorganize their governmental structures to get more efficient government and more effective use of taxpayers' dollars. In most cases, this process of reorganization has not resulted in smaller government. Most state governments have experimented with sunset legislation in an effort to limit the scope of state government. However, as demands for services have grown, state and local governments have also had to grow in order to meet new challenges. <laughs>